All right, come on, Crisfield. Let's put our hands together and say hello to all of our locations like you've never done it before. It's so good to have you all here. Oh, man, love you guys. Uh, as I always do, I want to take a moment. I want to look right into the camera. I want to tell you I love you. I care about you. I am so glad that you're here. It is wonderful to have you joining us at every single location and online. Uh, I believe that God is doing something special at Two Rivers Church, and I'm, I'm just really excited about what's happening in this series. We are in week number two of our series entitled Reply All, and this series is, is born out of the questions that we asked all of you on Easter Sunday when everybody gathered together, and, and what we did was we asked for specific topics that everybody wanted to hear about. And today we are talking about the number one most requested topic, uh, and in fact, it's been the same number one requested topic for six years in a row, and so that, that topic is handling stress. I know we're stressed out as a people, aren't we? Somebody turn to your neighbor, tell them, you look stressed. You look stressed. I, I'll tell you what, a, we, are, we are a stressed out group of people uh, in fact, let me tell you what stress is. Stress is the body's reaction to any change that requires adjustment or response. So the body reacts with physical, mental, and emotional responses. That's a really clinical definition of stress. So, so let me tell you what stress is. When, when, as a church, we were moving out of the movie theater and we were supposed to be going into the uh, we were supposed to be going into this bar that we had, and, and then the week before we were supposed to move in, they told us we couldn't move in there. That was stress for me. And then, and then we, were, we found ourselves at the Conklin Ave First Baptist Church, and we were in the gymnasium, and then some of the board members, while some of the other members had gone south to Florida and the pastor was away, some of the board members got together and had a secret board meeting, and then... They voted to kick us out of the church. That was stress. And right at that same time, we had, I think it was down, I'd have to check with Mary Lou on the finance team, but I think it was down to like $6 in the checking account. And we needed $10,000 in the next 10 days. And that 10,000 might have been 10 million. It just, 10,000 was like an impossible number in 10 days. Where are we gonna get $10,000? The bank ain't gonna give us that money, trust me. That was stress. Anybody had any stress around money? Okay, there's two people uh, that you guys are amazing. <laughs> Having children, that's stress, right? <laughs> like, now, I didn't have them physically because that's a whole nother version of stress. <laughs> Having them around, that's stress. I got to feed them. I'm trying to, like, I, I'm wired in a very specific way to do one thing at a time. I can do one thing at a time. I can watch television. I cannot watch television, hear any conversations that are happening. So my children, while I'm watching television, trying to de-stress, will come in and then they talk to me. And I have discovered that that is stressful. Like I, I, and I have a response to that stress called frustration. And, I, and I'll bark and I do all kinds of ridiculous things like, why? What is happening in me? What is coming up out of my life? There's things, there are responses that are coming out of me. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Planning a church and having children at the same time, that's stress. My wife in the hospital having our third child and then her heart rate began to drop and they put an oxygen mask and hit a button and the alarms go off and all the doctors rush in and all the nurses rush in. And I began considering what it would look like to raise three children under the age of four. That's stress, right? Here's, and here's, here's what it is. We all know what stress is, don't we? We all understand stress. We've all had our lifestyle has, has kind of burdened us down with stress. But I want you to know right now that we have a source 
that we can go to that will never run dry, a fountain of life that overflows into our soul. And I want us to learn that when we're stressed, we don't have to carry it. Whatever the thing is that's stressing us, we don't have to carry that because my God is more than willing to carry it for us. And so, so here's what I want you to know. Sometimes stress can be good. Stress can motivate you to prepare to perform. Like you're going to get ready to take a test. If you're, if you're not stressed out, you might not prepare so well. But if you're stressed out, you could go in, you'll study a little extra, get ready for that job interview. Stress can save your life in response to some kind of danger. It can prep up the fight or flight response. But I want you to know there's another aspect of what stress can do that can be positive because I, I want us to learn today that our stress can lead us to God that we can become more dependent on him, that we can give him the things that are stressing us. He is more than willing to carry them. Stress could also be negative. There's a, there's a way that stress becomes negative. When a person, when a person, a person is not a thing, <laughs> when a person faces continuous challenges without relief or relaxation, then stress is negative. What's happening to most of us, we're, we're carrying stress without any gaps between each stressor. What, what most of us are experiencing is that one stressor is packed on top of the next stressor and that stressor is packed on top of the next one. There's no gaps. There's no relaxation between each stressor. And what that leads to, stress is linked to six of the leading causes of death. Heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide. Each one of the top six causes of death are linked to stress. So here's what it is. Stress that continues without relief can contribute to a condition called distress. And here's what distress does. Just, just look down through this list and find where you're at on the list. See if you've experienced any of these. Physical, distress leads to physical symptoms such as headaches, upset stomach, elevated blood pressure, chest pain, sexual dysfunction, problem sleeping, depression, panic attacks, and other forms of anxiety and worry. Has anybody been there? Anybody find yourself on the list? And you say, okay, I'm getting stressed out thinking about the stress. Yeah. Anybody there? We're getting there quick. So, so here's, here's the real question. How do we rest from stress? The problem isn't that we have stress. Because stress could be good or bad. It's that we don't have any gaps in between it. We don't have any rest in between our stress. So here's what a lot of us do. We get ourselves into a stress cycle. The way that we respond to stress, for many of us, is through compulsive behaviors. So what we'll do is we'll turn to some kind of substance or behavior to try to relieve our stress and it could be anything from food, compulsive eating, like, like I, I, I need more chicken and dumplings. I got to have more chicken and dumplings. I don't feel good till I get more chicken and dumplings. And then, and then alcohol, tobacco. Like how many of us are smokers? You say, I, I'm not feeling, I need, I need a cigarette. I need a cigarette. Hand shaking, right? <laughs> I got to have some other, you got to go to tobacco, drugs, gambling, sex, shopping, all the husbands said, hey, get them, pastor, come on, get them, pastor, and the internet, right? There's, there's this, this thing where, where what happens is the thing we're doing to try to relieve our stress 
is actually compounding in our life the amount of stress that's accumulated. And so then what happens is we become more stressed, and our solution for that stress is the very thing that caused the stress originally, hence the stress cycle. So now we just, we just run in like a hamster on a wheel, trying to find relief, trying to find, how do I handle this thing? And we get caught in some negative cycles and some negative behaviors. Am I reading anybody's book today? Am I, we, we got, I got stress in my life and I don't know how to handle it. Because everything that I've done to try to handle my stress, compulsive television watching, I'm, I'm going to escape everything. And then I'm trying to, as I'm trying to escape, all these other people are bothering me while I'm watching television causing this thing to ramp up in my life. And so, so we're not the first people to be stressed out. Thank God Jesus understands this cycle. So I want us to turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 6, and I want to look at a stressful day in the life of the disciples. As you turn in Mark chapter 6, I want to pick up in verse 31, but I'm going to give you kind of the backstory to how this chapter plays down. The beginning of Mark chapter 6, Jesus starts out in his own hometown, and while he's there, he is basically, he's being disrespected by the people in his own village. He says a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. Like everybody's like, Jesus, who dare, how dare you? Who do you think you are to come in here with all your big time teachings and you're trying to heal people and whatever? Back up. I know you. I knew you when you were three. I changed your diapers. And so he's kind of disrespected. That's a big stress trigger. You go from there, Jesus then sends out the 12 and he tells them to go, just, just go without anything. Don't take anything with you. And, and so the disciples all scatter, and they go about from town to town and village to village, and they start preaching that the kingdom of God is here, and they begin to heal the sick. They begin to cast out demons. They begin to, and then they all come back, and they're super excited. But before they're able to come back, Jesus gets the news that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. And so now there's, there's grief that's been injected into the mix and what happens when we have grief? We want to just get away and we want to be able to mourn and cry. But in this instance, they're not able to do that because the crowds, because there's people that are sick that are being healed, the crowds are pressing around the disciples to the point that as we pick up here in verse 31, they're not even able to eat food. And so then... Because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Man, if I could just, we could just stop right there. We could just stop right there. Jesus' invitation, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus' invitation to us, one that we consistently and patently ignore. He has a freestanding invitation for every one of us to come with him to a quiet place and get some rest. So here's what happens in verse 32. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. So if you have your notes, you can just take, these, take your notes down, take your notes out on the back of the worship guide. And you can just write this down in every single location. What do we need to do to handle our stress? Number one is learn to take a day off. Learn to take a day off. We are so busy, we don't even take a day off. And here's what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day... What is this? What does he say? On the seventh day, everybody together, he rested. Let's try that again. On the seventh day, 
He rested from all his work. He rested. Now, it sounds silly, but I think I need to give you some permission to rest. Like, put down your tools and for one day, hang out. For one day, goof off. For one day, perfect the art of chilling. Like, like, do you know how to hang out with your crew anymore? Because here's in, on verse, in chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And look at this. Why did God make the seventh day holy? Because on it he rested. Look at this. This is this. Like we just, we speed over this verse. Why did God make that day holy? He made it holy. He, could, he was doing all the works of creation. He was doing all the works that are just magnificent and spectacular. We thought, oh, that's the holy things. That's the holy stuff. But it was on the seventh day that he rested, and that's the day that it became holy. There's a blessing found in the rest. He rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Exodus chapter 23, verse 12, begins to add to this teaching of take a day off. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day, do not work. Somebody turn to your neighbor right now. Tell him, do not work. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Do not work. So here's what it says. So that your ox and your donkey, what's the ox and the donkey going to do? So that the ox and the donkey, everybody together, may rest. That's craziness. We're going to just take a rest. And so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. The reason why we take a day off is not for us. It's not for God. It's for us, right? It's so that we can be refreshed. I almost said that in total reverse. Like, oh man, stone him right now. So, so Genesis, this, it's, this is the, the uh, it says in Mark, I believe it's Mark chapter 3, verse 27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God created a day of rest for us, for our benefit. And so, so really, what this is, this is about us taking the discipline to build a normal cycle of rest and work. Rest and work. Some of y'all are stressed because you ain't working. And so the Bible says if you ain't working, don't expect to eat. Like if you got some physical disability or some other thing, we totally have compassion for that. But if you don't have a physical disability and you're not working, God's plan for your life to find fulfillment is to get to work, work for the six days, and then rest on the seventh. And, and, and that'll begin to relieve the pressure in our life. We need the gap. We need to have the space in between these things to relieve. So what happens is if we don't get that gap, what happens is we have distress. People sometimes are wondering, like I, I always wonder why people doubt the scripture so much. Here's the simple idea. Chick-fil-A shuts down on Sunday. People freak out when they show up. Like, I need my chicken. And, and what's happened is they have figured out God's blessing and rest. And, and what happens is we have to learn to shut it down. We got to perfect the art of hanging out. We got to goof off more. We got to laugh more. We got to chill out a little bit more. And, and, and this is all the practical stuff that God's trying to build in our life so we don't experience all of the, the sexual dysfunction, all of the, all of the anxiety, all of the different things that creep into our life, the, the health issues from being so stressed out. It's all the practical stuff on a day of rest, eat well, exercise, play games, do care for your soul, get around some people that are going to be fun. 
God made this for our benefit. So, so here's, that's God's plan. This is God's perfect orientation. Now, how many people know that when you hear a message like this, if you've been in the church for any amount of time, you already know, okay, that sounds good, be really cool, but you don't know what my life is like. You don't know what my life is like. And that's why I wanted to go to Mark chapter 6 because I want us to look at what happens when we're in a season of life where it feels like everything is against you. Go ahead and pick up in Mark chapter 6, verse 33. But many who saw them leaving, so here they're trying to get away, remember? Jesus said, hey, come away with me. We're going to go someplace quiet and we're going to get some rest. So off they go. But in verse 33, it says, But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Son of a gun. They are ruining my rest. Like we're trying to get away. Jesus might be trying to go mourn the death of his cousin. The disciples are all burnt out. They haven't eaten yet. They're, they've been spending themselves, giving themselves to everybody else. Does it sound about like anybody's life, all the moms? <laughs> you, you didn't even get a chance to eat yet. And, and so it says in, <laughs> that, that what happened is now the crowd gets there. Jesus looks at the crowd, and he has compassion on them. And Jesus says, hey, here's what we're going to do. Because the disciples, they get tired after Jesus teaches all day long. And they're like, Jesus, let's send the crowd away because they're hungry. Which is, it sounds to me like if I was there as the disciple, that sounds like a great excuse for like, I think they're hungry, which translated as I'm very hungry. So if they can get out of my way, I can eat. <laughs> which may be the case because it doesn't sound like they've eaten yet. And so, so, They say, send them away. And then Jesus says this thing to them. He says, you feed them. I find this to be remarkable. This is this amazing moment. Jesus says, you feed them. Talk about stress. What are you talking about, God? I'm supposed to now feed this huge group of people, and I haven't even eaten yet. This is interesting that we can follow Jesus. If you're following Jesus, he can call you to do some things that are stressful. Following Jesus, Jesus never promised life without stress. Jesus never promised life without difficulty. Jesus tells the disciples to do something that is patently impossible. And what I believe that Jesus wants them to learn is what I believe that Jesus wants us to learn. you got to look at me right now. I want you to hear this. That your stress can lead you to God. That, that God has provision, God has supply, God has resources laid up in heaven that are waiting for us to be received if we will just learn to go to him. And so God has a plan for our life that stress can be the greatest gift that we ever received. We've been looking at stress like it's this terrible thing that ever happened. Like, I got so much stress, what do I do? It's because we're looking to the wrong things. And Jesus tells the disciples, you feed them. He says, I'm going to lead you into the impossible where you can no longer depend on your own strength. I'm leading you into a place where you're beyond yourself. I'm leading you into a place where I can finally break you down, that you'll finally surrender. Sometimes God's putting stress in our life in a way that it'll weigh, it'll weigh up so much that it can find, will they finally surrender? Will they finally give up? Will they finally stop trying to carry it all? God wants to get us into that place where he leads us to, I can't do this anymore. One of the most beautiful moments you'll ever experience in your life. God, I can't do this. 
When the day seems like it's long, when, when everything seems to be piling up, when the stress is piling on, when I can't get away from the crowds and I can't control the season, I can't even get a day off, God has something more for you and for me. There's a rest that comes from God that's supernatural. There's a supernatural provision that comes from him. But we are busy going about our day, doing things in our own strength, in our own ability, in all the natural. And God is calling us into an invitation with him. Come with me. Would you hand it over? Would you let me take up your thing for a moment? So Jesus says to the disciples, go find who, who's got something. They find a little boy, says he's got a few loaves and some fish, and they give it to Jesus. I love it. They give him what is not enough, but they finally surrender to Jesus. They finally say, all right, Jesus, you take this thing. You take what I got and carry it. The scripture says Jesus took it, one of my favorite verses. He gave thanks for what was not enough. Some of us in our stress need a perspective reorientation. To give thanks for the things in our life that's not enough because it leads us to him. If if we have any sense about who God is and about what God wants to do in our lives, we'll realize that the things that are not enough are the opportunities for his miraculous power to be displayed. And so so Jesus takes it and he breaks it and he gives it out and he feeds the 5,000 men, which we know is maybe 15 to 20,000 people in the crowd. And at the end of it, the disciples have to pick up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Mark 6, 45 Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Now, their crazy day is not done. He taught them all day. They rode all night the night before. Now they've been up for hours and hours and hours, going without sleep. They haven't had sleep now for 48 hours, and, and, and they're in the boat trying to get to the other side, and Jesus, in verse 46, leaves them, and he goes up on a mountainside to pray. Jesus gets alone by himself. I think now he's talking to God about his disappointment with John being beheaded. I think he's having it out with the Lord. We don't get a picture of what's happening here, but I think Jesus is grieving now. And he wants to get away from the disciples. He wants to get away from everyone so he can have his moment with the Lord. And he gets away and he begins to pray. We go into verse 47. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and Jesus is alone on the land. And this is what happens in life. We get where we feel like we are far separated from God. We get where we feel like God is nowhere to be found. He's abandoned me. And I'm carrying all of this stuff and I'm carrying all this thing. And I'm, and I'm try- look at this, verse 48. He says, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because after all of this, and Jesus has sent me out in the boat and I'm just being obedient to God, even the wind was against them. Even the wind, it was like, come on, now it's going to rain? I haven't eaten, I haven't sleep, I'm trying to just get to the other side. Jesus is hanging out on the shore, and we're out here, we can't even get to the other side. What is Jesus' plan in all of this? Even the wind was against him. And, And how many of us, when we've been in the middle of stress... You've been in the middle like, oh, man, stuff. Once stuff starts going wrong and you start thinking, oh, you start, anybody have a pity party ever? Anybody ever have a pity party? You start getting like, if you give in to the pity party, now now stuff starts getting bent. Like our thinking starts to get bent because now it says shortly before dawn, he went out to them. Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. One of the most cryptic verses. Like Jesus is just going to skip it. Like you guys are on your own. 
I'm going to walk on over to the other side. And I have literally, like that's what it says. He's going about to pass him by. It was such an interesting thing. Like, what is it Jesus up to? And, and here's what it is, verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. Talk about like, all right, we ain't slept in a long time. We haven't, we, we got to eat, but, but, but we're out here straining against the oars. And now we're seeing a ghost. Like stuff's just getting, like stuff's getting bent in their minds. And they cried out because they all saw him and they were terrified. And, and in verse 50, it says, immediately he spoke to them and said, and this is the verse I want everybody to hear. I just love this. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. I want you to hear this in the depth of your heart. I want you to, when you're facing what seems like the most difficult day, when you're facing what seems like opposition from all around, when you're facing the insurmountable, when even the wind is against you, I want you to hear the voice of the Lord as he goes by. He says, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them, the wind died down, and they were completely amazed. You and I, we can obey Jesus, and he can send us straight into the storm. I'll never forget. I'm going to have the team come back. I'm trying to, we, we moved from Springfield, Missouri to Binghamton, New York in June of 2012. We started the church. We had an amazing launch, but we had done all of this fundraising. We had spent about a year raising money to start the church. And when we started the church, we spent all of our money on all of our equipment and our gear to move into the Regal Movie Theater on Front Street in Binghamton. When we got to the first Palm Sunday, Crystal and I had gone on vacation. We came back from vacation. And I remember going out, I needed something from the trailer. Because when you're doing mobile church, you, everything goes in the trailer and you have to go in there to get it and it's a big ordeal. So I remember going out to the trailer on a Friday afternoon and as I'm walking out to the trailer, I look at it and I see there's kind of equipment kind of scattered around the outside of the trailer. And I think to myself, how goodness gracious, the incompetent people that I've left here. They didn't even put everything back into the trailer. So I'm getting ready to go yell at somebody. How dare they? And I get closer to the trailer and I realize the trailer's wide open. This is not good. And I, I began to investigate and I realized our trailer had been broken into and $22,000 worth of our equipment had been stolen out of our trailer the weekend before Palm Sunday, just as the church is getting started. And I want to tell you, in that moment, I had a choice. In that moment, I had to make a decision. And I, and I want you to know that I had discovered the life-giving presence of Jesus, that when everything's going wrong and everything's not right, there, that you can have an overflow. You can have the presence of God overflow in your life in a way that it, it has nothing to do with stuff. It has nothing to do with circumstances. And so I wrote an email that day to the church. And I said, hey everybody, this is what happened. I just wanna read it to you. Today I discovered that $22,000 worth of media, sound, and kids equipment has been stolen from the Two Rivers trailer. I expected to be angry. I wasn't, with one exception. They took the kids Wii and sound system. That made me angry. Come on, people, stealing from kids is not cool. Our equipment's been robbed, yet I feel blessed. I feel a wonderful sense of peace. I feel like the hand of God, I feel the hand of God on me for this moment. Instead of asking why or feeling like a victim, I feel wonderfully close to Jesus. There's a calm sense of purpose and provision that God is in control. My heart knows there is nothing that was taken that will stop what God wants to do. We don't need stuff to be the church. 
I bet God shows up on Sunday just like he did last Sunday. Ironically, I bet our people call on his name a little bit more fervently, sing a bit louder, and give more generously. I'm willing to bet that God gets more glory because of this. We're going to tell our kids someone took the we, but not our joy. Our joy doesn't come from stuff, but from following Jesus. This has never been about stuff. This has always been about using our stuff to lead others to Jesus. Take the stuff away and we still win. Jesus is going to be glorified. I have peace because my heart was never running after the equipment. My heart is running after Jesus. We cashed in our retirement fund and quit our jobs to invest in souls. This has always been a losing proposition financially. This was never a get rich scheme. We came to Binghamton, New York, not Beverly Hills, California. We came based on the promise that Jesus was going to build his church. I've had the privilege of being along for the ride. This is another moment where I'm along for the ride. I look forward to watching Jesus do what only he can do. I want to, I want to invite you to watch with me this moment in time as Jesus builds his church. I'm full of joy because I know what is coming. Jesus wins. Come on, somebody. Jesus wins. Amen. Come on, we, we got a joy the world can give and the world can't take away. That stress can come and, and I want you to learn how to take what stress has put on you and give it to God. You don't have to respond in anger. You don't have to respond in despair. You don't have to respond in frustration. You can go to Jesus. I want you to, point number two, write this down. Learn how to give it to Jesus. Let that stress drive you to God. Let that stress kind of give you the opportunity to know I need to lay it down. This is a mystery to many people. How do I give it to Jesus? How do I, in the, in the difficulty of my anxiety, when all of my thoughts and reasons are spinning out of control, and when my normal pattern has been this, how do I give it to Jesus? Here's what Psalm 55, 22 says. Cast all your cares on the Lord. It means you gotta talk to him. You gotta tell him your thing. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. When you're spinning up, when you're ramping up all of your stress burden and all the catastrophizing of what the future might hold or how terrible the moment right now is, God wants to take that. When you talk to him and you say, God, this is my thing, this is where I'm at right now. And, and what I have learned, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says it this way. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. This is so beautiful. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Go to God in prayer. Go to God in prayer. And, and what I have learned to do when I go to God in prayer is I wait for the answer. I don't just say, God, here's my thing. Okay, I'm moving on. I did the thing that God said to do. I wait till God, I wait till I get the overflow. I wait till I get a response from God when God speaks to me and then all of a sudden there's a miraculous transfer that takes place that I know that God has now taken my cares. He's taken my anxiety. I get as much stress as anybody else. I get, I have as much load as anybody else. I got as much worries and concerns as anybody. I just stop carrying them. You don't have to keep on carrying them. You can lay them down. And, and I just give them to God. And so, so Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is my life verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, this is the key. Submit to him. Like when I get... God tells me something and I don't like what he says, I do it anyway. I submit to God. I hear his voice and then I obey. And, and, and so, 
So Isaiah 40, verse 30 and 31, it says, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, another way of saying this is those who wait on the Lord. Do you connect, do you put the connection between hope and wait? That God, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on you now. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. You're going to come and you're going to talk to me. You're going you're gonna to answer my thing. God, what are we going to do about this trailer that's been broken into and stolen? Will, I got you. I am able. I'm the God of the loaves and the fish. I'm the God who steps in the boat and the winds and the waves calm down. I'm the God who rose from the dead. I'm the God who spoke to Lazarus and said, come forth. I'm the God who in creation spoke in the heavens and the earth and everything was established. I'm the God who has the cattle on a thousand hills. I can provide. I can take care. I'm the God who heals you. I am Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord Almighty. I'm enthroned in the heavens and above the earth. I am the one, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. you got to have God speak to you. And then when God says, I got this, I walk away. He's got this. My Jesus is able. My Jesus has got my back. My Jesus is on the scene. And I don't care what happened to the trailer. I don't care what happened in the way. I don't care that we got kicked out of Conklin at First Baptist Church. I don't care that we got $6 in the bank account. I don't care because Jesus said, take courage, it is I. Do you know who he is today? Do you know that my God is able? He is able. Come on. Somebody better give a praise break. Jesus. 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 I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry. I don't have to have anxiety. I don't have to carry this thing anymore. I give it to Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to give it to Jesus. You don't have to carry it anymore. You don't have to carry it one more minute. Whatever the thing is that's got you bound up, whatever has got you all weighed down, whatever it is that's, that's got you in a place where you can't go anymore, it's the greatest gift in your life. Because for once, you're going to surrender. For once, you're going to say, okay, I'm beyond myself now. I need God to show up. And if you'll cast all your anxieties on him, you'll cast all your cares on him. If you go to him and you talk to him and say, God, I'm not leaving from this spot until you come and you minister to me. God, I'm not leaving from this spot. I'm going to learn how to lean into you. I'm going to learn how to have you carry what I cannot carry. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You're going to live with righteousness and peace and joy in your life. That stress isn't going to overwhelm you. You're going to be an overcomer. You're going to be somebody that no matter what happens, no matter what tomorrow may bring, I know that I have victory. It's the song in my heart. It resounds wherever I go, whatever I do, that I have a faith in a Savior who's able. And so that's what I want every one of us to learn today. I want us to go to Jesus. I want us to let Jesus in. I want us to surrender to him. And so if you're here today and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, you're ready to surrender for the first time, I just want you to slip your hand up in the air and say, Pastor Will, that's me. I surrender my life right now. I give Jesus control. I, I'm tired of carrying it. I'm tired of doing things my own way. I'm tired. I'm beyond the point of me being able to do this. I finally realize it's time to surrender. If that's you, just have every head bow and every eye close. Just slip your hand up in the air right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else, you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus. You're ready to give your life to him. Right now, just with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray this prayer, every one of us together. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. And just as I am, I surrender my life. I give you my everything. I know that you died for me and rose again. 
You took my place. Now I surrender all that I've been carrying. I give it to you. I surrender to you. Take my life. I belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen.